Welcome. This is Approaches and Methods and Language Teaching by Richards and Rogers, Chapter 3, The Oral Approach and Situational Language Teaching. So we're going to talk about the development of the oral approach and how that led to the development of situational language teaching. And both were developed by British applied linguists. And we're gonna talk about vocabulary control and grammar control and selection, radiation and presentation and more. Okay. <clears throat> and if you remember from the last video, a method according to Richards and Rogers consists of an approach, <clears throat> um, a design and a procedure. Okay. So let's take a look at the main characteristics of situational language teaching now, and we'll do so again later. So one, speaking is more important than writing. And in the classroom, the target language is used. And number three, this is the key, new input is introduced situationally, meaning through context. And four and five, vocabulary and grammar need to be carefully selected. And six, reading and writing come after speaking. So the oral approach and situational language teaching were developed by British applied linguists <clears throat> um, from the 1930s to 60s. And they had a significant impact on course books up until at least the 80s when this book was written. And <clears throat> the oral approach was the first method that really took a principled and scientific um, approach to English language teaching. And a couple of the key figures were British applied linguists, Palmer and Hornby, who were influenced by people such as Jesperson and Jones. And <clears throat> some of the books that were based on the oral approach um, from the 60s to the 70s were Alexander's Fluency in English, O'Neill's Colonel Lessons Plus, Access to English, and Streamline English. Okay. So it's important to note that the oral approach was quite different from the direct method. So the direct method really didn't have any structure to it. It was just a matter of a language learner being immersed in the foreign language that they wanted to learn. Whereas, as we just saw, the oral approach took a very systematic and scientific approach to language learning, to language learning and teaching. And one of, or the first component of that scientific approach was vocabulary control. So <clears throat> the 1929 Coleman report on reading by Algernon Coleman, officially called the teaching of modern foreign languages in the United States, a report prepared for the modern foreign language study, um, proposed that reading more would help learners improve their foreign language skills. And this shouldn't be confused with the 1964 Coleman report, a different Coleman, um, which was about equality of education, equality in education in the US. So he said that um, it's fair to assume that the amount of reading uh, that if the amount of reading were considerably increased in modern language classes, they would result in more rapid growth in rate and in comprehension. 
Other aspects of vocabulary control included the idea that there are 2000 core words necessary to read a new language. And <clears throat> then we um, have the interim report of vocabulary selection by Fawcett, Palmer and West in 1936, which was a vocabulary guide and which was revised in 1953 by West. <clears throat> in his uh, book, A General Service List of English Words, which became a standard reference for teachers. And so <clears throat> the 2000 most useful words um, <clears throat> are not necessarily the most common words, the most useful words. So here we see a list. Um, the first number you see there is the rank, one, two, three, four, et cetera. And the second number is the frequency of occurrences per million words on the brown corpus. And then finally you see the word itself, the, be, of, and, etc. And here you see the covers of the books that I mentioned, the interim report and a general service list of English words. The next, the next aspect of the scientific approach to English language teaching in the oral approach um, was grammar control. So Palmer, developed procedures for teaching grammatical patterns because he believed that there was a universal grammar which should be used and taught. So Palmer, Hornby, and other British applied linguists promoted the use, to, promoted the use of sentence patterns, which we would now call substitution tables. So this systematic approach to teaching the lexical and grammatical content of, of English laid the foundations for the British approach in ELT, the oral approach. And here we see the <clears throat> first EFL dictionary, 1953 by Hornby, Gattenby and Wakefield. And some other books um, influenced by influenced by the oral approach, a grammar of spoken English on a strictly phonetic basis by Palmer in 1939, a handbook of English grammar 1945, and Hornby's 1954 guide to patterns and usage in English. So <clears throat> um, selection, gradation, and presentation. Um, are important for both the oral approach and situational language teaching. So selection meaning choosing the right vocabulary, the right lexical and grammatical input and gradation meaning organizing that input and presentation, how you teach it. So some methodology textbooks from the 1940s and 50s and 60s that described the oral approach can be seen here. They were written by French, Gurry, Frisbee, and Billows. And Gurry said that <clears throat> every teacher of languages should devise ways and methods of getting the new language used as it is in real life. And he also said that a command of structure is more easily acquired by reading, speaking, and writing than by studying explanations. Another key figure was um, the Australian George Pittman. He was one of the biggest supporters of the oral approach in the 1960s. And you can see him here. Um, um, at a function of a new Diptisol course, and he was influential in Australia, New Guinea and the Pacific territories. And his colleague, Gloria Tate was um, famous for her Tate materials. And this is really interesting. This is a little note in the July 1963 Pacific Islands Monthly. And it says, um, a review of language structures, English and Maori has been made by Gloria Tate of the New Zealand Education Department. Uh, firm foundations. 
a teacher's handbook for the Cook Islands. And <clears throat> in the forward, there's an interesting suggestion that the standard spoken English in <clears throat> the Cook Archipelago is probably higher than in most Pacific islands and eventually may replace the Maori language. Okay, and here we can see Pittman's 1965 series, situational English, and we can look inside and see what we would now call <clears throat> a substitution table. So we have the sentence pattern, how much is that in vocabulary, bottle of medicine, pair of socks, et cetera. And then this blank is blank. This medicine is 70 cents. Okay. So to review the main characteristics, speaking is more important than writing. <clears throat> In the oral approach and situational language teaching method, um, the target language should be used in the classroom and new input should be taught situationally, meaning through context. And we'll look at that in more detail in a moment. And you have to be very selective with regard to vocabulary and grammar and reading and writing come after learners have adequately mastered the new input orally. So here are some of Hornby's books, Oxford Progressive English for Adult Learners, books one, two, and three. You can see um, what uh, the books were like here. So Hornby coined uh, the term, the situational approach in this article in 1950. Um, so we have the oral approach, the situational approach, the structural <laughs> situational approach and situational language teaching. And Richards and Rogers chose just to use the term situational language teaching to avoid confusion. So that's where the term situational language teaching comes from. So if you remember from the last video, a method consists of an approach, a design, and a procedure. So let's see um, what the approach, design, and procedure are for the uh, for situational language teaching. So an approach consists of uh, the theory of language and the theory of learning for that approach, for that method. Okay, so we have um, for the theory of language, British structuralism, where speech is viewed as the basis of language and structure is the heart of speaking. <laughs> so Firth and Halliday developed powerful views of language in which meaning, context, and situation were given a prominent place. And context was the functional trend in British linguistics, starting as early as the 1930s. And many British linguists saw a close relationship between structure and context in language teaching. So the theory of learning behaviorist meaning process, not conditions. So the processes for, um, this, for situational language teaching include input practice and mastery. And French even went so far as to say that that mastery could be accomplished through blind imitative drills. And regarding the teaching or learning of grammar, situational language teaching uh, used the inductive approach, meaning learners are supposed to 
use the language and determine what the rules are. So there was to be no explanation in either the learner's native language or languages or the target language. Rather, they were supposed to learn the rules intuitively through context because it was believed that explanation and translation would weaken the impression of the input on the mind. And it was believed <clears throat> by proponents of situational language teaching that <clears throat> uh, ESL and EFL um, teaching and learning was similar to child language learning. So the design of a method includes the objectives, the syllabus activities, the activities and the roles. So you can see here that situational language teaching is very teacher centered with the teacher being viewed as, as the conductor. And the textbook is also central to, to lessons in situational language teaching with, with um, an allowance for realia. So the objectives would be teaching the four basic skills through structure and that accuracy um, is very crucial and errors should be avoided. And <clears throat> accurate speaking will lead to reading and writing skills and students have to master structure and vocabulary before engaging in free speaking. So the syllabus structural in nature with basic structures and sentence patterns arranged according to their presentation and sentence patterns would include statements, questions, requests, and commands. And structures are always to be taught with sentences and vocabulary is based on the sentence patterns. Um, and this is not the same as the notional functional approach. So a notion is um, <clears throat> an idea, something you want to do with the language and uh, the function would be the, the objective. So basically the functional notional approach is about preparing students for using the language outside of the classroom and situational language teaching is about how the language is presented in the classroom. And activities. Um, so again, uh, you have to focus on the situation or the context of how the new input is presented and drilling is used, repetition, substitution activities, course repetition, dictation, drills, et cetera. And students can work in pairs or groups. Um, <clears throat> so it's situation or context, meaning how you present the new input using realia, pictures, activities, mime, gestures, with no explanations or translation. And example sentences should be related to the context. And the roles of learners, the roles of the learners, the teacher and the materials. So the learners are receptive. They just listen and repeat. They have no control over the content um, with some freedom later on. And the teacher is the conductor. They set the pace. They're responsible for the presentation, modeling and situation setup. Okay, and the materials, um, teachers should use textbooks and visual aids with the textbook being central to the lesson and the teacher should be the master of the textbook. And the lessons should be tightly organized and planned around a particular grammar structure. So the procedure for situational language teaching will vary based on the students levels and <clears throat> Practice should go from controlled to freer, and oral drilling should precede speaking, reading, and writing. 
and more specifically, um, <clears throat> teachers who used this method would start with listening practice in which the students would just listen and the teacher would repeat a word or a sentence. And then next will be choral practice. <clears throat> and the teacher would just use a simple command like repeat. And then the students as a class or in groups would listen and repeat. And then individual oral practice in which the teacher could check students' um, pronunciation on an individual basis. And then isolated sound practice of difficult sounds, words, or phrases. And then Q&A, um, <clears throat> new input practice being introduced with old patterns and then elicitation and then substitution drilling and then Q&A drilling and then correction, ideally peer correction. And this procedure could be followed by reading and writing activities. Okay, so in conclusion, the oral approach which led to situational language teaching from the 1930s to 1960s um, were both very structural in nature. Um, but in the 1960s, teachers started questioning situational language teaching, um, which led to the development of communicative language teaching. Um, and we'll look at communicative language teaching <clears throat> in chapter five. So what do you think of situational language teaching? What parts of it do you think are good as far as language learning and teaching are concerned and what do you think are bad? And uh, do you use any aspects of situational language teaching? Do you think it still affects the way course books are written? What, what thoughts do you have? What questions do you have? So that's it. Thank you for watching and have a great day.